Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you are very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. Today's video is a response to a comment that was placed under my Q&A post from a few weeks ago. In that comment, I was asked what might have happened if Catherine of Aragon had capitulated to Henry's request that their marriage be set aside, if she had agreed that it should be annulled. Now, before we jump into this counterfactual historical exploration, I do want to quickly run through a reminder of the rules that I have imposed upon myself when I engage in this type of thought experiment. And I also want to lay out why I think this practice is valuable. Firstly, while this practice is rooted in the available historical information, once we cross the proverbial Rubicon and start changing that known historical event in our minds, what comes next? The suggestions we make about what might have happened is only ever going to be educated guesswork and thus can be disagreed with. And that's one of the reasons why I really love reading your thoughts in the comments and the live chat. Now, I personally think the value of this guesswork is that it does force us to shine a light on a particular event, the event that we are going to be changing. That helps us to really assess its impact. And I think this is made possible in particular because when we play this game, we are removing that historical event from the chain of known events. Now, I have set a rule for myself that I will only ever change one event, everything else, unless it would likely or indeed conceivably have been impacted by the change we're making, will follow the historical record, at least as far as we know it. Right, now we've got all of that covered off. Let's take a look at what might have happened if Catherine of Aragon had agreed to the annulment. I have made a few videos that should provide some additional useful context for this discussion. I've got videos on Henry VIII, on his so-called Great Matter, on Catherine of Aragon and on Anne Boleyn, and I will be leaving those linked. But now, I would also like to give a brief rundown of the story so far, if you will. Catherine, daughter of Isabella of Castile and Ferdinand of Aragon, married King Henry VIII on the 11th of June, 1509. Her new husband would turn 18 later that month. She was 23. Henry's kingship had begun around two months previously, following the death of his father on the 21st of April 1509. These newlyweds had known each other for years. Catherine had travelled to England and married Henry's elder brother Arthur, Prince of Wales, on the 14th of November 1501. She was widowed within months. Arthur died on the 2nd of April 1502. For the rest of her father-in-law's reign, Catherine's future was unsure her place debated, and her means of support transient. Her 1509 marriage must have felt, I think, like an end to all the uncertainty and turmoil. As far as she was concerned, she was Catherine, Queen of England. She and Henry would have a joint coronation, and then, surely, Catherine's children would rule England after their father, because this was the way of things. Between their marriage in 1509 and the end of 1518, Catherine would fall pregnant on at least five occasions. Of these pregnancies, the only child that would survive infancy was the Princess Mary, who was born on the 18th of February, 1516. Henry VIII would soon claim that he had long doubted the validity of his marriage. He was concerned, he asserted, that she was really his brother's wife and not his. After all, did not the much relied upon passage in Leviticus state that, quote, If a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He hath uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. Henry must have extrapolated out of this that childless really meant without sons. By 1527, Henry VIII was ready to make moves to have his concerns recognised and remedied. Cardinal Thomas Wolsey was charged with investigating the matter and, if necessary, with securing an annulment for his king. On the 22nd of June of that year, Henry told Catherine of his concerns and of their need, in his view, to separate. Catherine was furious 
and immediately set about mobilising her network of support. She wrote at once to her nephew, the Emperor Charles V. She asked him to intervene with both Henry and with the Pope. By October 1528, Cardinal Lorenzo Campeggio arrived in England as a papal legate. He came with a commission that gave him permission, alongside Wolsey, to try the validity of Henry and Catherine's marriage. Campeggio had, however, received a separate secret instruction from the Pope that he should stall for as long as possible. In a letter dated to the 17th of October 1528, Campeggio wrote about a meeting he had with Henry VIII. Among other points, we learn that they, quote, then discussed a proposal for persuading the Queen to enter some religious house. With this, he, meaning Henry, was extremely pleased. And indeed, there are strong reasons for it. Campeggio also noted that the king is determined to allow her whatever she demands, and especially to settle the succession on her daughter in the event of his having no male heirs by another marriage. It was concluded that I and York, meaning the Archbishop of York, Thomas Wolsey, should speak to the Queen about this on the following day. Campeggio reported that at this meeting, the Queen, quote, stated that she had heard we were to persuade her to enter some religion. I did not deny it, and constrained myself to persuade her that it rested with her. By doing this, to satisfy God, her own conscience, the glory and fame of her name, and to preserve her honours and temporal goods and the succession of her daughter, that she would lose nothing. Se non luva della persona del re, which means, if not the use of the king's person, which she had lost already and which I knew she would never recover. In discussing the use of the king's person, Campeggio's implication is a sexual one. He continues, that she should rather yield to his displeasure than submit herself to the peril of a sentence considering, if that went against her, in what grief and trouble she would be, and in how little honour and reputation, and that she would lose her dowry, because in cases of matrimony it was concluded that on the dissolution, whensoever and howsoever of a marriage, the dower could not be recovered. But what if Campeggio's persuasions had been sufficient? What if, at this moment, in the last months of 1528, Catherine had agreed to the annulment of her marriage. If she had gone willingly into a religious house, perhaps even taken up holy orders. Well, to get an idea of how things could have gone, we might want to take a look at a famous example of the aftermath of another royal annulment. Eleanor of Aquitaine married Louis VII of France in 1137. During their marriage, Eleanor gave birth to two daughters, Louis like Henry VIII centuries later, was not satisfied with this state of affairs. And on top of this, this marriage, this relationship, does appear to have been fairly high conflict in general. This marriage was annulled in 1152 on the grounds of consanguinity. It was thus being asserted that they were simply too closely related to be married, since they were, as Constance Britton Bouchard writes, quote, connected by blood within fewer than the permitted seven degrees, being related within four degrees on his side and five degrees on her. That is, he could count four generations back to their common ancestor, while she counted five. In modern terms, they were third cousins once removed. The lands Eleanor brought to this marriage were hers after the annulment. Her daughters, however, did remain in the custody and keeping of their father, they were recognised as his heirs. Sarah MacDougall points out that, quote, while some scholars assume that the Archbishop of Sens, who pronounced the marriage of Eleanor and Louis Null, also stipulated that their daughters were nevertheless legitimate, there is no evidence that he made such a statement. In fact, it was not needed. No one saw the legitimacy of these daughters as in any doubt. And this remained the case for these girls, even when their parents went on to marry other people. Eleanor would marry the future Henry II of England, by whom she would have many children, sons and daughters. Her sons included Richard, who is remembered perhaps best to history as Richard the Lionheart, and also John, who's often called Bad King John. 
while Eleanor's daughters by Louis made marriages that befitted their status. Their parents' annulment seems to have had little to no effect on this for them. And so perhaps we might take this example, or at least part of it, as a potential formula for what might have happened between Henry and Catherine. If Henry had been rendered free to remarry at the end of 1528 or even at the start of 1529, rather than feeling the need to fight it out doggedly at home and abroad until 1533, is it possible that some of his more unpleasant character traits and behaviours, shall we say, might never have come to light? And if so, what might this mean for Catherine? Well, if we think back to what Campeggio reported when he stated, the king is determined to allow her whatever she demands. And now, of course, we might well think, well, that's easy for him to say, isn't it? Or, well, he would say that, wouldn't he? And in many ways, that's probably fair enough. However, I do think that we can find, in Henry's later treatment of Anne of Cleves, at least some evidence that his statement to Campeggio about how he intended to treat Catherine might, in fact, really have been what he meant. But that still leaves us with the question of what might that look like? Well, unlike Eleanor of Aquitaine, I don't think that Henry would have included the option for Catherine to remarry. And so perhaps, like Anne of Cleves, she would have been permitted to simply absent herself from court, to move between a collection of properties given to her by Henry, if only she had asked. However, as entry into a religious house, into holy orders, was the thing that was specifically mentioned, let's think about how that might have turned out for Catherine. To do so, perhaps we should take a look at the experiences of some other royal nuns from England's history. First up, we've got Henry VIII's own maternal aunt, Bridget of York. She entered holy orders at Dartford Priory in Kent. Her sister, the Queen, Elizabeth of York, mother to Henry VIII, paid to support her. Bridget of York remained at Dartford Priory until her death in the early decades of the 16th century. There is another example from around 200 years earlier of Mary of Woodstock. She was a daughter of Edward I, and Eleanor of Castile, and she entered Amesbury Priory. While there, she continued to receive money and grants throughout her life. She was also allowed to be a regular visitor at her father's court, and when she travelled, it was with an expensive and expansive entourage. During her time at court, she also managed to rack up impressive gambling debts. Catherine of Aragon could then, arguably, have enjoyed a fairly similar existence and standard of living to that that she had enjoyed at court. She could perhaps have visited the court. She could have spent time with her daughter Mary. As an individual whose piety was frequently remarked upon throughout her life, Catherine would, I think, have adapted to convent life with ease. She was, after all, known to partake in pilgrimages. She wore a hair shirt close to her skin at points, and she fasted often. Now, of course, her comforts, her quality of life, the freedom she enjoyed would, in large part, have been dependent on the particular faith order that she joined, and also, principally, on the wishes of the king. However, in regard to that last part, that was, of course, also true of her life at court. Indeed, while I can make no statement about her conscience or the health of her immortal soul, I nevertheless am of the opinion that Catherine's last years would have been far more comfortable and potentially much happier if she had done as Henry wanted in the late 1520s. I also think it is likely that the legitimacy of Mary would either not have been discussed or it would have been explicitly affirmed. Mary's place in the succession, as Henry had allegedly confirmed to Campeggio, would only have been superseded by the birth of a brother in some later marriage. And as for Mary, presumably she would not have spent those key years in her development resisting her father and his government. If she had remained the Princess Mary, the King's honoured, obedient and entirely beloved eldest daughter, possibly with permission to spend time with her mother at various points, I do wonder how that might have affected her character. What might this have meant for her queenship, if she ended up ruling in this timeline? With no question about her legitimacy or her obedience, 
I think it's likely that Henry would have sought to make an advantageous marriage for her, likely with a foreign prince with whom Henry wished to seal a treaty. Now, in the late 1520s, Francis I was a possibility for this marriage treaty, as were his two eldest sons, Francis and Henry. Maybe, though, they would have been prepared to wait for Charles V's son, Philip, who was born in 1527 to reach a marriageable age instead. In either case, at the appropriate point, I think Mary would have left England for her new homeland and husband. Mary thus, almost certainly, would make her marriage as a younger woman than she ended up doing. Is it possible that Mary might have had the time to secure that Tudor male heir that her father so wished for? Could she have done it before her father's death in 1547? Could she even have done it within the early years of her marriage? And if she did, might that have eased her father's anxiety, his own desperation for a son? And if so, what might that have meant for his next wife? If Henry's marriage to Catherine had been recognised both at home and abroad as being null and void, then universally the English king would have been understood as being free to make a new marriage. And I think most of his advisers would have been pushing him into making a foreign match. Charles V's sister Eleanor had been widowed back in 1521, just as an example. With the daughters, sisters, aunts and even mothers of countless foreign noble and royal houses as potential matches, is it possible that Henry might have been swayed in their direction? If he had been able to contract a new marriage in 1528, he would, after all, not have spent all of those years, all the way through to 1533, being embattled and increasingly frustrated and embittered. In the real timeline, Anne becomes his confidant, his advisor, his chief supporter. In addition to being his promised prize once all of their shared hardships were over. But without this history, without this shared experience, is it possible that Henry might have found it easier to make a diplomatic match? Perhaps, though, Henry was indeed struck with the dart of love to such an extent that he was determined that he would have Anne or no one as his wife and queen. If, then, Henry and Anne were free to marry in late 1528, early 1529, I think we might expect that Anne would have been pregnant fairly soon afterwards. And perhaps her first child on this occasion, at this time, would have been a boy who would have been his father's unquestioned heir. Maybe, by becoming a mother for the first time at this earlier date, she may even have gone on to have more surviving children. However, if, as happened, Anne still gave Henry one daughter, Elizabeth, and no other living children, then I still think her fate might have been different in this new timeline. Princess Mary would have been Henry's heir presumptive. Princess Elizabeth would be after her. If, in 1536, Mary was already married and perhaps the mother of a son, then I have to wonder if Henry would still have been inclined to end his marriage to Anne. If, though, a new marriage were to be his chosen route, then I see no reason why Anne could not have been set aside, as Catherine had been, with an annulment, also on the grounds of consanguinity, because, as we know, Henry had that relationship with Anne's sister, Mary. And perhaps her annulment would have been followed by entry into a holy order too. Indeed, I think that even if Anne were still to have been accused of treason, tried and convicted, even if her male co-accused were to be executed for those crimes, I think in this timeline, she would have been spared. I think she would have been sent to a convent, albeit for a far more restrictive and sparse future than she might have expected without the treason. And in large part, my reasoning for this is the fact that executing an anointed queen had never been done before. And there had certainly been traitorous and indeed adulterous queens in history. I wonder, even if Henry and Anne's relationship had broken down spectacularly and utterly, whether without those years of waiting and fighting, without the break from Rome that was done to secure his annulment, without that litany of alienated and executed friends that Henry racked up in order to secure Anne as his recognised wife and queen, Elizabeth as his recognised heir, if Henry would have ever felt the need 
to destroy her so completely at the end. Or even if he would have been so, frankly, megalomaniacal to even consider it as an option. The Princess Elizabeth, as I believe that she too would have remained, and that's whether her parents stayed married or not, would very likely then not have lost her mother before her third birthday. I think at worst it might have been a case that she was not allowed to see her mother, and that's only if Anne were cloistered away, probably following a conviction for treason. In time then, her father would likely have sought to make a marriage for her, one that would befit her rank as his daughter and as a princess of England. Nevertheless, I do think it's unlikely that Elizabeth would actually have been living as a wife prior to her father's death in 1547, as at that time she was only 13. If, though, Anne was still alive at this point in 1547 and able to orchestrate it, then perhaps Elizabeth would have gone to live with her until she was deemed old enough to either marry and or to head her own household. I think that Elizabeth would surely have been welcomed at the court of the next monarch, whoever that might have been, whether that monarch was her full brother or perhaps a half-brother who had been born to a subsequent wife of her father or even her half-sister Mary. Perhaps Elizabeth would have shown herself to be a doting and favoured aunt to her sister, the new Queen's children. I mean, after all, some of those children might have been pretty close in age to her. In matters of faith, in a similar way to how I think the timeline would have played out if Henry's elder brother Arthur had lived long enough to become king himself, and I have made a video on that that I will leave linked, in much the same way, I think in this timeline, that the Reformation would not have landed in England when it did, or in the way it did. That's not to say that I don't think it would have happened. We must, after all, consider the spread of reforming thought in Europe. The fact that during the 16th and 17th centuries, England's nearest neighbours would become increasingly Lutheran or Calvinist. With this in mind, then, we might assume that England's Reformation would have been more recognisably Lutheran or more likely Calvinist in form. And if this were the case, then I think the knock-on from that is that the English, later British monarch, would likely not be, nor ever become, either the supreme head or the governor of the church in England. In this chain of events, I can't see how Henry and or his government are going to be drafting the acts of supremacy and or succession nor can I see them mandating the swearing of oaths that recognise these acts on pain of being deemed as traitorous and then being executed as such. And so, men like Sir Thomas More would presumably have been spared, which in More's case would also result in him not being later beatified as a martyr to become Saint Thomas More. Cardinal Wolsey, having achieved the annulment Henry wanted, would, I think, likely have remained in royal favour until his death. Perhaps his plans for his elaborate tomb would have been realised in this case. If so, and if it were still preserved until today, it would most certainly be an absolutely massive draw for tourists. I do wonder if Thomas Cromwell would ever have reached the heights that he did, without the fall of Wolsey and the continued need to secure an annulment for Henry. If the break from Rome and its oversight never happened, if Henry VIII never became the supreme head of the Church of England, if he never had the reason or the opportunity to test and or expand the limits of his power, I do wonder, how would history remember him? Without the execution of Anne Boleyn, would there ever have been the execution of Catherine Howard? Indeed, if Henry had had living grandchildren, specifically grandsons, at some point before his death, I wonder, would there even have been six wives? Well, what do you think? Do you agree with my suggestions of how events might have played out if Catherine of Aragon had agreed to the annulment? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comment section underneath this video. I would also love it if you could pop an emoji or a social glyph in the comments too, because that will boost the engagement. And the more engagement a video gets, the more YouTube shares it out. And that does help to grow our community. As we are talking about marriage, annulment and royalty, one of those emojis, whatever those terms perhaps evoke for you emoji-wise, pop that in the comments. I am looking forward to seeing what you pick.
You can also find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to the place you can find me on the internet in my description box. Please do follow me over on some or all of those so that we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope that you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please share it with your friends. In fact, if you like the channel, let some pals know about it. You can tell me that you like this video in particular by hitting the thumbs up. Please do subscribe to the channel. And if you think you're subscribed, have a check now. Make sure that you have not been unsubscribed against your will by naughty YouTube. While you are there, checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, please do hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down that will appear. And that way, YouTube allege they will tell you when I've next uploaded, but also when I am next planning to go live, which I do to talk about the history news. And I know you are not going to want to miss that. The good news is we have also got a fail safe. If you head over to my website, www.katrinamarchant.com, I'm showing it on screen. Go to the contact page. In the contact page, you will see a box. Put your email in there that adds you to my mailing list. And once a week, I will send you an email to let you know what I'm up to and send you any links that you might need. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye for now.